Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. We're also on BitChute and YouTube. You'll find the links in the podcast description. I'm also a podcasting coach because I've got five podcasts. And you'll find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. Today, my guest, also a podcaster and speaker, please welcome Aiden Nipom. Did I? Nipom? Nipom. Nipom. So you know welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Aiden Nipom. Yeah, the yeah, listeners know who's Aiden. Yeah, so I host the Changed Podcast, a podcast that explores uh, what we mean when we use the word change through the lens of storytelling. So I interview guests uh, to share those moments of pivot in their lives when something changed for them. I am a professional speaker. I'm a professional improv performer. I am a senior facilitator for On Your Feet Improv for Business and president at the Art of Change Skills for Life. Excellent. Very good. So I know I'm going to go into all the speaking thing and everything, but uh, yeah, podcasting is uh, of, of interest to me. And I, I see, is it Captivate that you uh, host with here? Yeah? Yeah, I just switched to Captivate. So I um, I was self-hosting for a long time. And then I, using the Seriously Simple podcasting plugin for my website, and then I went ahead and went over to Castos for hosting. And I didn't really see any benefit to having them as the host. So I switched to Captivate, which continually seems to be offering more and more and more. It's like every week there's something in my email. They're like, there's this new cool thing we're doing. So, um, and I, I can't even keep up with all of it to utilize all the features that they offer. But I, so far, I'm really pleased with the move. And to be honest with you, because there, there's a load of them out there. And I remember looking at it before and it didn't seem that much, but I see now where they're, they're sharing it. And to be honest with you, I hadn't heard of a few of them because, you know, I tried to go to the bigger ones. Obviously, we were all on Spotify, Google and everything. And then like iHeartRadio was one that I found I don't know, a year ago, whatever. And I saw, OK, that makes a difference. But when I looked at actually after checking that you were with that, I went through it and I said, wow, it's sharing it to a lot of blood that I wasn't even aware. And I love that because. You it's know, you don't awesome. just you don't know where people are listening from. And you know, to me, even if there's one listener that's on a certain platform, I'm happy enough to put the RSS feed because it's easy. Once it's there, then it automatically goes up. So I always say to people, hey, if there's a platform that you like and I'm not on it, you know, and the same with yourself, you know, you'd be happy to actually, you know, go on it as well. Yeah, so- absolutely. Yeah. I um I, you know, I've manually submitted my RSS feed to um to some of the podcast apps like GeoSavan and um, I can't even remember. Some of them aren't automatically pushed to there through Captivate, but um, they do make it really, really easy. And yeah, and it's been a learning journey. My first podcast I hosted on Anchor. Is that where you are currently hosting? I've got some of them on Anchor. I've got four and I'm really kind of looking at one for the coaching side of things because I want to offer more and one with Podbean. And because Anchor was bought, I mean, I was uh, 18, 2018 yeah. with Anchor, then they got bought out by Spotify. And I'm Spotify. like thinking, hey, are they actually going to, you know, be a competitive advantage? But to be honest, I, I don't think they're straight with their figures. Like, and there was times I said, there's something going on here. And they were like, oh, we made a mistake. Next, I went up 5,000. And I was like, you know, I'm in the top uh, half percent with this. Mm-hmm. And the other one is in the 1%. And there's more numbers in the 1% one, which they learn Polish one. And, and, and it's like, I know by meeting people that there's a lot more listening than what they're showing. You know, I, I don't kind of let it get to me, but at the same time, it's like, why would they do that? Did you, so was it, you kind of yeah. conscious? Of, yeah. Yeah. It, Anchor was fine. Actually, it was great as a first, I think for people who, uh, I imagine some of your listeners are, are constantly weighing whether or not they want to start a podcast of their own. So I'll go ahead and say that, Anchor was a great first host experience for me. Um, That podcast was co-hosted with a friend and we didn't have podcasting microphones at the time. We really didn't, like we didn't know what we were doing at all. And we're like, let's just start and we'll learn as we go. Um, And that podcast is still there. It's called The Positive Thin Pact for anybody who's super interested. Um, It's a friend of mine was her idea and mostly her journey. And I was there as her personal improviser uh which is something i think is kind of a cool idea 
that she coined. Um, but using my background in improv, I sort of helped her think through some of the stuff that she was thinking about. And then I always made her play a game at the end of every episode. <laughs> so, so, I mean, how did you get into the improv? I, I started doing improv as a child. <laughs> I, um, I took acting lessons and in those classes, my acting teacher, Lee Kitts, had us doing improv exercises as a way of getting more comfortable when you forget your lines, uh, as a way of deepening characters, as a way of just generally speaking, being a better performer. And so I think I started around 12 years old in those classes, learning improv. And by the time I was in high school, I grew up in a really small town and this is before the internet. So I, I thought to myself, you know, wow, this, this improv thing is really, is really special. And I think it deserves a place on the stage. So I think it should be its own art form. And I didn't realize that had already happened. Like improv as an art form had already, that was where these games were coming from. Like I didn't put that together. So I thought for a period, brief period of time around 17, 18 years old that I had invented improv as a stage performance as opposed to just a training tool. Like my senior thesis in high school was an improvised theater performance. And I was like, look at, look at what I am doing. I am creating a thing. Uh, and, and years later, when I went and lived in a city, <laughs> I learned that improv had already been invented, which is how I had learned about it in the first place. So I've been doing it a really long time and, uh, and teaching um, since uh, like consistently, I think I went from being sort of a hobbyist to being a professional improviser and about started that journey in 2009. And I know yeah. that uh, your father was a professional speaker. And was it something that he encouraged you to do? Or is it just something that just kind of was there and you ended up doing it? Yeah, I think. So my dad had me be in a play. We were in a little community theater play together when I was six. And he his thought was that if he could get me on stage young, that he would be giving me this gift of, of confidence. Like if I could deliver lines in front of an audience, then I would be able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with confidence and, and this was his gift. And then what happened was I fell in love with people laughing at my jokes and, and giving me applause. And I got, I got really addicted to just the stage aspect of it. Um, I'm actually like at a party, I'm kind of an introvert. I go sit on the sidelines and wait for somebody to come have a conversation with me uh, unless I'm like, working on that actively, you know, um, but in front of an audience, I feel very at home. And so, yeah, so I'd say it was his encouragement because he thought that that was a gift he would give me. But as far as the improv thing goes, that just was a, a thing I fell in love with and marrying the two things, his speaking, um, his speaking career as he's now retired and I now uh, am president of the Art of Change um, with with my improvisation background, that was an unforeseen outcome that has ended up, ended up being really, really a wonderful, you know, marriage of ideas. So, so yeah, I would say my dad's always encouraged me to do things that I love, but it's improv specifically. I, I don't know if that was yeah, yeah. No, no, perfect. that and, story or, yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious, like having a father that professional speaker I presume he yeah. was traveling a lot if you were in a small town was it something that you missed or that he went away or did you all kind of go with him what was the kind of no he was gone a lot and um, he would go out on tour for you know a few weeks at a time and uh and yeah I mean and he was a single dad essentially so some sometimes I'd go live with my mom um she lived in another state uh or I would go stay with friends, family friends. So um, there was this one family in particular that had a kid my age, a little boy, and we told everybody we were siblings because I stayed at his house so often. So we just told everybody we were brother and sister. And then later in high school, we like tried to come clean and nobody believed us. <laughs> we we're like, we just made that up when we were six years old. And everyone was like, why would you throw your brother under the bus like that? I'm like, no, we're not. 
we, we don't have the same parents. <laughs> have you never noticed we don't have the same parents? So, you know, it was like, it was just one of those things, but yeah, he was gone all the time. And I remember growing up, I got to go on the like really exciting trips, like overseas. Um, I got to do those trips. So we, we did the, he did a tour through the whole UK and he did a tour through, um, through Asia and I got to go on those tours. And so that might be why I, I got bit by the travel bug because I was traveling as a kid, but for the most part, he would go and then he'd come home and he'd put a pin in a map that hung on the wall. And I was like, someday I'm going to do that. And yeah. have you done much traveling yourself with this being, or do you kind of stay in oh, a yeah. certain, yeah? Oh, no, no, yeah. I've done a lot of traveling. I've, um, I, sometimes for speaking and sometimes for, uh, work as a facilitator, I do a, a lot of facilitation work as well, meeting facilitation. And so I've done both and, and also as an improv performer and teacher, I've traveled internationally. So, um, for all of those things. So it's, yeah, it's, I, I enjoy travel quite a lot. I know I think that if you're doing that, it's brilliant to see different parts of the world experiencing, you know, cuisine, culture, the whole lot, but Absolutely. you have to be into it because, you know, sometimes, you know, people are doing it just for the, the sake of, you know, the business, then they don't really enjoy it. But obviously I can even see with yourself that you enjoy it. Yeah. I always think that's such a shame. I, you know, my dad was always very much a down to business traveler. He would, uh, check into his hotel. He would have his meals delivered to his room. He'd go out, do his seminar, come back, pack up, like go to sleep on a schedule. And I was like, man, you've been to all these places and you haven't been to any of them. Like how tragic. And he was like, I just, it was the job. I'm just doing the job. And so for me, I, I've always made a point to get out of the hotel and go see something, you know, like you're in, in Chicago, you got to go to at least a art museum. There's so many art museums and galleries there. Um, you know, if you're, if you're in some place that has a really specific cuisine, you should go eat it, <laughs> you know? No, definitely. So and, I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. And now that he's passed the reins on to you, like, have you had the discussion with him? Does he feel that it was like justified everything he's done? He enjoyed it. It was, or did he kind of go, yeah, f f kind of regret all the traveling? I think, I think if, if he, I, I mean, we've talked about it, so I should know the answer. I just don't remember what he said. <laughs> I, like, I think he would just do it all the same if he could go back and do it again. Um, yeah, he, he's very much a, a person who just loves, you know, like to be in his home space. And he and my stepmother always do an amazing job of creating a lovely place to, to live. And so I think they just, for him, the, the exoticism of travel just never compared to that wonderful feeling of being at home. So, yeah, I don't think he has any regrets about it. Brilliant. No, and I think it's important for the listeners because you know some of them uh, you know they're you know aspiring to do that and yeah it's good to know this sure. I, yeah I mean know yourself right like Thanks. it's your life create your best possible outcome for you and be honest about it because if what's really true for you is that being at home is the reward and travel reminds you how much you love being at home that's an okay wonderful outcome be honest about it don't force yourself to do something that's not you and if what you love doing is sightseeing and taking in new stuff and trying new foods like do do that <laughs> No, 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 exactly. And like for me, I mean, because I went, you know, I was late to the game getting comfortable on stage, but I got offered a few jobs to do speaking and, you know, it, it more in the Asian market and uh, the Middle East. And mm -hmm. the money was good, but like I've got a, an eight year old boy, my youngest child, and I have equal custody. And I just didn't want to be away. But now I'm taking him in July to Tallinn for the month to do my value university. And for me, that's more important. I can do my stuff at home. I'm comfortable here. But so everybody, you know, different strokes for, for different people. Like, and so yeah, I think that's right on. And I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do that. Um, as long as whatever you're doing feels fulfilling. And, and I think there's something to be recognized in 
this thing where like if you travel often you start chasing status airline status like you've got your airline that you're a regular with and you've got your hotel card and whatever and so you're just like constantly chasing that status until you get there and then you got to maintain that status and at some point it can get to the point where like you're traveling in order to maintain a more pleasant experience when you travel and I would suggest that that's a watch out like that's that's a place where you may no longer be experiencing the joy of it and it might be time to take a take a breath and assess where you're at I know that I kind of hit that point right prior to the pandemic i in January of 2020, I was like, maybe I, it's time for me to travel less. I think I'm just chasing, chasing that next status level. Like I was always jealous that my dad was a million miler. And I was like, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. They're really going to treat me like somebody, you know? <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, wait, that's not, that's not about the work. It's not about my clients and it's not about the adventure anymore. So I was, I was actually starting to reassess how much travel and how I might shift to move online more. And then the pandemic came along and was like, do it now. <laughs> travel none, move online. Brilliant. Universe and, has a weird yeah, it, I, I think a lot of people, they, you know, they had to make a transition. So how, how has it been for you to kind of move online? What, what, what have you learned and how are you, how, how are you finding it? I mean, so there are advantages and there are disadvantages of being online that I think are really surprising. So, you know, I've, I had done online trainings for several years prior to the pandemic. So I thought I really knew what I was doing, but then um, because everyone had to move online, all of the tools just like took a steep incline into like features. And so, and so now it's like, the things that you can do with your slide presentations, the things that you can do with putting people into breakouts and how you can time out something is so incredible that now being in person, it's like, oh man, I wish I had the ease of these tools in person now. Um, so that's a super bizarre shift that has definitely happened. And the truth is that for right now, most of the people that I've been working with are still seeking online. I have, uh, I have the majority of folks making inquiries about online. I know there are groups that are having in-person um, events, but I've only had personally had one uh, inquiry and then we had a date conflict. So it didn't even happen. <laughs> um, so I was already booked for the date that they wanted. I would have gladly, I would have gladly gone to uh, Nebraska or wherever they were. I've never been there um, just so I could put a pin in the map, but uh, you know, it just didn't come together. And I'm hearing a lot of people talking about like kind of hybrid, you know, you will have half, half the audience yeah. to be present there. I think that's going to be a weird one to kind of navigate it. You know? I think so. I, I have done a couple of hybrid events where I've been the online person and they can they can work well, but what you need is a co. So I've been the co-facilitator for a colleague who was doing the in-person presentation, and and that it, that is what it takes it in order to have it run smoothly. Somebody on the online side, and then somebody in the in-person side. Okay. I just want to check in. Is the background noise coming through? My no, it's husband? grand. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. I just did the getting my kid ready to go nah, to school. No, don't worry. And... It's, yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's all okay. It is all okay. <laughs> so I know that um, you've done a TEDx and yeah. I listened to it and I, I like a load of guests have done the, the TEDx, but you were so natural on it because a lot of the times the people are doing the TEDx you know they've rehearsed it like even one person told me it's like a thousand times I mean there's no way I would rehearse something a thousand times but a lot of the times lots of times but I mean you might tell me the journey but I know just from looking at you I don't know was it totally scripted to be like that but just the way you were interacting with the audience and everything I thought you just were like engaging with the audience but doing it in a fantastic way thank you uh it was rehearsed um much more than I normally am. But uh, I, like I said, I feel really comfortable in front of an audience, the dynamics of an audience, 
makes sense to me. I can feel the ebb and flow of energy. I can ride that wave. And I also feel completely comfortable being myself. So you may have caught, there was a vulnerable moment as I was telling that story and I just was honest. Um, and I surprised myself at, at the emotion that came up from, but like that just, it happened and it was very real. And it, and the, the cool thing about that. So when you can allow yourself to just be you, to show up, you know, be your best you, but you know, you're there to give them a good time. Um, but allow some of the real you to shine through. It, it carries people on a ride, I think, with you. They come with you on that journey. It's, it's like, um, yeah, my dad always said, you know, make them laugh or make them cry. Or if you're really good, do both. And so I think, <laughs> I think that was that kind of that what happened naturally in that moment. But um, it's kind of funny. So that TEDx talk was one of those things. So for most people, you apply to be a TEDx speaker. That's how you, and your topic gets selected and that's how you do that. Um, but for some people, and I was one of these, you know the person curating the salon. And what happened was at the last minute, I was asked to do a talk and I did not have a talk prepared because um, I hadn't been pitching. And so... Naturally, I said yes, because uh, as many of your listeners who are speakers will attest, this is like a bucket list item for almost everybody that's like to give a TED talk. Um, and a TEDx is good. A TED would be better, but like a TEDx is really good and you feel amazing when you get to do something like that. So here I have this opportunity, um, but I had to get it together in two weeks. And I was like, well, I, I'm going to say yes. It's an obvious yes. And I'm going to trust that I think this is that improv background for me. I'm going to trust that I have one idea worth spreading, which is the constraint of a TED talk, one idea worth spreading. Now, I help people with communication skills in the workplace. So it's usually like, here's three tools and 17 experiences to help really um, drive that home for the audience so they get to walk out with something tangible that they can take and use having had practice. So now I've got to do one idea worth spreading. And that was surprisingly hard for me, like shockingly hard. I was like, okay, here's my one idea. The, the three things you need to do to whatever. It was like, okay, no, here's my idea. Seven ways to, and I was like, everything was a, like a list of numbers. So I, I have in my, uh, in my Google Drive, I have like all of these partially created talks, all these talk outlines that were candidates for this TED Talk. And I went to the rehearsal. They have a rehearsal. You know, they have coaches for you and stuff like that. And I went and the feedback that I got, I, I really thought I had nailed it. They were like, we don't know what your topic is. And we're going live in, you know, three days. So you're going to need to nail that down. So I immediately started to panic. And by the way, my husband, who has helped people with their TED Talks for years, kept offering to help me. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 I'm a professional. I got <laughs> I can put together a talk. I got this, you know? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to use your help. Once I have my talk, I'm going to deliver it. And you can give me some notes, you know? And he's like, okay. Well, it came down to that point. So I got that feedback that they didn't know what my topic was. And I came home and I had a meltdown and he was like, now, can I help you? And I said, please, please help me. And so he was like, well, show me what you got. So I delivered my content for him. And he was like, he was like that first thing, that first thing you said, that's your, that's your talk. And he helped me really like hone it and rehearse it and, and was amazing. He's just amazing. I mean, obviously I love him and impress, I'm impressed by him because I chose him, but like, it, I don't think I could have delivered that TED talk in such a natural way without his help um, because I would have been too worried about is, is it a single idea? Um, but the single idea of finding that thing that brings you joy and just doing more of that until you figure it out, that is an idea worth spreading. 
that you don't have to have the plan laid out in front of you in order to take a single step. You can start taking steps and the plan can unfold. And that was the message of that TED talk. And my husband was the one who helped me find it um, in the mess of stuff that was coming out of my mouth and head because I was panicked. So I guess the moral of the story is ask for help sooner, have more fun. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. And uh, yeah. like, I know you do workshops as well and mm -hmm. you know, in the kind of business environment. So, you, you know, like, I, I, I think I've written down there, like you've landed a lot of big boys, Uber, Dell, Nike, and, you know, so mm -hmm. I suppose, because there's a lot with the workshops and I like to kind of know how you structure it, but also when people are made to go, you know, the difference between people getting the choice uh, yeah. to go. Yeah, yeah. Well, so <laughs> when people are are required to be there, it is um, it is definitely a different vibe than when people choose to be there. That being said, as a person, and this is true as a keynote speaker as well, people who are, so a lot of times, I don't know if this happens to you, but I'll get hired to give a talk that's part of a larger event that's like, we're going to give you the, here's our sales numbers this quarter, here's our projections, here's some really dry marketing data, and now here's a keynote speaker. <laughs> on change or whatever. And then they follow that with like some words from the president of the org. I get that a lot. And that is a really tough audience because you're coming in after people are like multitasking and then you want what you want is for them to pay attention to you, right? Because you because you have lots of value to offer, but also because we're we're all just suckers for the audience as well. We want, we just want that that feeling. Um, but it's also like, they're not going to have a great experience of you if they don't actually get the content you're giving. So, uh, and the same is true in a workshop, you come in and they, there's like this expectation that people are going to be able to multitask. Um, I come from the world of improvisation and interactivity and experience. So in a workshop, I'm pretty clear up front to set expectations. Here's what's here's what this is not. This is different than keynote speaking, where you're going to capture somebody's attention through story, or you're going to have them have a have an experience right off the bat that gets their attention. Um, in workshop, you set expectations. You're like, here's what this isn't. It's not one of these. It's not one of those. You're not going to be able to do that. Um, here's what this is, and you tell them what it is. And here's what you're going to walk out with. And you make your promise for what they're going to get. What's the value for the timing of having spent any time with you whatsoever. And that typically will address that thing where people are like, I don't want to be here. I don't. Um, what I don't do and what I would caution people against doing it is I don't throw the client under the bus for having made people be there. So I don't come in and say, look, I know a lot of you have to be here and I'm sorry about that. Like, just don't do that. <laughs> it's not helpful. Um, while it is helpful to acknowledge your audience's reality, that little piece uh, is never gonna actually work in your favor. It's gonna jeopardize your relationship with the client that hired you. And as far as your audience is concerned, maybe, maybe you get a laugh for a moment, but then they're gonna check out because you've just given them permission to check out. So it's better to be like, here's what you're going to walk out with. Here's why you want to pay attention. Uh, and, you know, and if, if you haven't gotten that at the end, if you feel like giving them a guarantee, then you come see me and we'll talk about it. But you want to, you want to give them something that they're going to want to have uh, so that the time is, is worth having spent it. And I have gotten feedback from plenty of people who were in my audiences, either for a workshop or a speech, who were like, I really didn't want to be there today. And I can't believe how much value I'm taking away with me. And, and that's what you want. That's what you want people to walk out with. It's that feeling of they're having, having been glad they spent the time, whether they were forced to be there or were there by choice. Excellent. And like you, you yeah. mentioned there that you're kind of respecting, you know, the, the, the client that's actually hiring you, paying for you, you know, instead of, you know, because a lot of people do that. And the other thing is you see it as well, you know, on stages that 
like for speakers that they don't really they're kind of serving the audience and disrespecting the who's hired them and I, like the the ones that i see coming back is like i go to a lot of events like the mind valley and you know the ones that are actually coming back are the ones that acknowledge and appreciate and given reference to the client during their speech yeah you know what i learned years ago from Shana Merlin, who I used to co-facilitate with all the time. Uh, she, her company is called Merlin Works uh, Institute for Improvisation. And we still work together sometimes because we really like each other. Um, but she, I, when I started teaching for her improv school and we started performing together. So this is the improv setting, but it's a lesson I think we're taking into the speaking and training world. Uh, what I used to do is we would go out on stage in front of an audience and I would throw the theater under the bus, throw the audience under the bus um, and I would get laughter. So, you know, like I would do it in a way that was like really clever and really sarcastic and people would laugh and I thought I was doing great. And then she gave me a little piece of feedback. Um, she's a master at doing that giving feedback that you want to hear. It's incredible. Um, and what the feedback was that she gave me was that she found that audiences are more interested in the show, that's what she said, when they feel appreciated for being there. They are more quickly on board with that show. They're more interested when they feel appreciated for being there. And so I took that to heart and I was like, at first I was like, okay, I'm going to test that out. I was like, am I not doing that? She's like, well, I mean, sarcasm gets you laughs, but when the audience feels appreciated, they're going to be excited about your show. So I, so I tested it out. I was hosting one of our shows. It came out. And the first thing I did was thank everybody for being there. I was like, you know what? You could have been anywhere tonight. You chose to be here. And we are really excited about that. Thank you for choosing us. And man, was that a hot audience that night? They were, they were loving the show. And it, I was like, I'm never going back gratitude gets you everywhere. So I think that um, it's not just about exhibiting gratitude for your audience, but gratitude for your client, gratitude for the space. And you don't have to spend a ton of time on that to exhibit that gratitude, but that, that attitude of gratitude uh, is in fact, everything it's hyped up to be. No, definitely, definitely. And I mentioned the kind of larger clients that you, that you've got, but obviously, mm -hmm. like, because everybody aspires to getting that. But you know, it's it's is it a, an association that you got into to kind of help you do that, or what was your kind of build up to your journey? Like, it was it like yeah, it took me ten years to get one of them, or how, how did it? Um, right. Well, okay. So, so some of that is just luck. Some of that is, um. Like, for example, Dell, the story of how Dell came to be a company that I did many trainings for um, was with Merlin Works, actually. That was when I was with Merlin Works. Um, I've now probably delivered, gosh, I would think we delivered 30 trainings for, for Dell. Um, but when I first joined Merlin Works as a teacher, I didn't really think of, I wasn't trying to be a speaker. I just was teaching improv classes and I had the opportunity, Shana would get these corporate clients every once in a while. Somebody had taken an improv class and wanted to bring that into the workplace. So she sent me on a really exciting job to work with HP. We worked with them for a week, facilitating improv games, writing scripts. And then we were the acting talent for an internal video they were creating. So they had a tight timeline to turn around a video for a sales conference. And we helped them with every step of it as improvisers. And it was super cool. So I came back from that. And I was like, how do I do more of this? <laughs> I just want to do this. This is awesome. And Shana was like, well, the, you know, they don't, these things don't come around very often, but next time they do, I'll keep you in mind. And that was kind of how it went for a few years, but like, I was hungry for it. And my dad and I had had that conversation that if you watch my Ted talk, I, I go into a lot of detail about, but like, I, I was 
I was figuring it out what I wanted to do. And it was like, this was what I wanted to do. So at some point I asked Shana to just give me the corporate training side of her business. I was like, will you just give the Get, just give that to me. I will bring clients and we will do this work. And, and she was, she was amazing because she didn't say no. She also didn't say yes. She explored the idea with me. And this is something that I, I tell people to do. Take the time to explore an idea before you turn it down or accept it. Explore it. Just five minutes of exploration will get you everywhere. So she was like, well, what would that look like? How do you imagine that going? And we ended up coming up with an agreement. She did not, in fact, give me half of her company. <laughs> like, here you go. Um, I was so naive to think that she would, but man, what we did create was amazing. And the first opportunity she gave me, she said, I have a cold lead at Dell. <laughs> She's like, maybe you can turn that into something. She's like, or not, it's fine. It's a cold lead, so there's nothing to lose. And it became a hot lead immediately. Like I made a phone call and they were like, let's talk. And next thing you know, we're negotiating this contract. And once, this is the thing, once you have one client that you've worked with that is a big name, now you have all of them. So Lockheed Martin came after that. The Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas came after that. So now all of a sudden we're just like, that's now who we're working with. Um, and meanwhile, I had all these conferences that were coming through that I was doing with Art of Change because I was wearing these two hats. Art of Change, my dad's company, he had me being a speaker for him. I'm a facilitator for her. And so my experience with all these companies starts coming in, all these conferences, I'm meeting people, and it all just sort of built from there. Um, so yeah, some of those have been speaking engagements for Art of Change. Some of them have been training engagement, improv training engagements for Merlin Works. And some of the corporate clients that I've had are facil meeting facilitation that I've done through on your feet and proper business. So, or sorry. Yeah, no, that's what it's called. So, you know, it's like you just start saying yes to opportunities and opportunities build has been my experience. Um, but ultimately, I think if I were to rewind that story all the way back to the beginning, to that first phone call, that first phone call was the thing that did it. It was making the phone call. It was actually saying, hey, this is what I'm working on. And I heard that that might be something of interest to you. Is it? That was what it took. So and even if you rewind it another bit, it was like you realized you love doing this. So you threw it out there and you kind of made a focus yeah. on that. Where some people they're kind of all over the shop and they do anything by actually putting it in your head in your target, you set it, you put it on the radar and it all came together. Beautiful. Yeah. But I'll tell you, it was very much, a, uh, and I find that this is really true for literally every sales conversation I have. I was just genuinely curious to see what they needed. And if we were a fit and if it was possible, like if this was going to be a thing that came together, um, I never make the assumption that I'm the best fit. I, I know what I have to offer is valuable, but they also have specific needs. So it's not a commentary on whether or not I have value to offer if I'm not the best fit. Uh, that has definitely happened in, uh, in a few cases on quite honestly, not many, by the time I'm on the phone with somebody, typically they're already interested, um, at this point, but in the beginning, it definitely like making these phone calls. And then she gave me another challenge. She was like, here's a client I've had for a long time. And I need to, I need to raise prices. <laughs> and, and I did, I just did it. I called them and I was like, Hey, I, you've been a long time client. We love that. And also, I don't know if you know this, but like our prices are way higher than what we've been charging you. And at this point, we, we have to raise our rates, but we also love that you've been part of this, you know, story of this company for so many years. And then I just asked them, I was like, what do you think that we should do? What would be fair? And we came up with, they, they made an offer that was much better than what I was going to ask for. I just told them what we were charging everybody else. And then I was like, here's what we've been charging you. Here's what we're charging everybody else. 
And they were like, oh, well, then this is what we should be paying you. So, you know, I, I think people make it really hard on themselves and they try and like do it right. And I find that if you just approach things with curiosity, um, genuine curiosity and interest, it just gets you much farther. And I love that negotiation because you're coming in at that. And the worst case is you're not going to really lose them unless you've decided, you know, that the point, you know, you're, it was going to raise and, you know, because negotiating is a skill yeah. set in itself. And to be honest with you, that was a great way of doing it. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, literally the worst case scenario is they would have been like, oh, we can't afford to do that. <laughs> so either, either you just keep doing it at their lower rate, or I guess we'll find somebody else. They could have said that. Yeah. And we would have then had to have a, a decision-making meeting where we chose one path or another, but we didn't have to because we asked them to help us solve the problem. So I know you've kind of the different hats on with the social media because it's something that I'm kind of curious because uh, yeah, it drives me crazy, to be honest with you. And I'm just w wondering, yeah. you know, with all the different things, what's your kind of go-to place? <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like I have a social media home these days. I, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there. Um, I left Meta January 1st of this year. I've decided that Meta is bad for the world. And Excellent. yeah, and I don't want to be part of that. So I made the really difficult decision to leave my 3,000 international <laughs> connections from all of my years of travel um, behind. I was like, you know, here's where you can find me. I hope that happens. And some of them did and some of them didn't. Um, yeah, I had a, I had a couple thousand followers for Art of Change and the Change podcast that I also left behind. And I was like, I hope you follow me where I go. But some of them did and some of them didn't. And I'm still navigating what it means to not be part of Facebook and Instagram. But um yeah, it feels better not to be playing into that toxic, uh, self-righteous indignation on a regular basis. I heard since I left that it's been less toxic, but I'm not willing to go find out because what I believe is that as a person who helps people communicate effectively, it just brings out the worst in people. Like it just... And no, I like the, al the algorithms are in favor of uh, negativity, toxicity, and everything. And I mean, I should be taking uh, you know lessons from you on that because my awakening podcast is actually exposing corruption and fraud. And like, what, you know, yeah, I mean, I've been shadow banned and everything, but one of my uh, good friends, you know, he, you you always have these supporters. They'll give you a thumbs up for everything, and uh, he actually saw it disappearing, and he checked all the other ones all of his uh, thumbs up were gone. And even with uh, YouTube, I mean, they're, they're not good boys either. Like I see numbers oh, no. going back and, you know, I see sometimes they're 500 come back, got kicked off YouTube, but there's so many of them out there. And I'm just, I'm just waiting for a decent person to create something that we're all on because we're all on 50 things to hope that we're not missing out on something. And the reality is we're skimming through every single one, wasting hours of our life, just trying to connect to people yeah. online instead of going to get a coffee and meet somebody and talk to them and actually really connect with somebody. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, so I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm not really because I don't care for it. To me, it's like walking down the Las Vegas strip. It's like a lot of bright lights and a lot of people who want attention. And I just, I don't, I don't enjoy hanging out there. Um, but I'm there. Twitter is just as toxic as Instagram and Facebook, but I felt like I had to stay somewhere. So I still have a Twitter that if you go check it out, you'll see I post stuff sometimes. And it feels pretty impersonal. And that's because it is. I'm not I, me. I'm not giving Twitter me. They don't get me. Um, but if people want to know about upcoming episodes, you'll see tweets about those. Um, but if you subscribe to the podcast, then you wouldn't even need to be on Twitter in the first place. So, and um, I, I tested out something called BizFluence. I'm hanging out there every once, maybe once every two months or so. I Go check on that to see if that's any better. Um, my favorite social app right now is Marco Polo. And it's because I get to have walkie-talkie face conversations with my friends that don't get deleted. I haven't and even heard of that one, Marco Polo. Marco Polo, it's, I've, I love it. 
yeah, I've been having, I've been having incredible conversations with a handful of friends and it feels like going to a coffee, but I'm able to do it on my schedule. So I, you know, it's like, I don't have, to, I can send a message that answers a question or share an observation or whatever, send that off to them. And then when they have time, they're going to look at that and they'll respond as if I'm right there with them. And so it feels like when I go back to watch their video message, it feels like they're with me in the room um, as much as a Zoom call feels like people are with you in the room. And so yeah, you could be just downstairs in the kitchen there with your coffee. Like you know, exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I love so to I'm, be honest, Zoom, I think it's a great way of connecting. Like it's the yeah. next best thing to actually meet. Next you. best thing to be in there. So Marco Polo is like that only uh, it's on your own timing. So if you're really busy, it's, it's, I I'm really loving that. And, um, I've been able to have really meaningful conversations with people that have a different perspective than I do about politics, about public health policy, about all kinds of things. And our conversations are meaningful and productive, and we share our different perspectives, which I value strongly. Um, and so that's been really great. Uh, and it's a totally different vibe than um, writing a message that's like, here's my opinion. And if you don't like it, you can unfriend me now or whatever, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is something I've never said. I've never said the unfriend me now, if you don't like my opinion, I just, uh, I'm and like clubhouse not my, not I, my vibe. I with the clubhouse i like that at the start because it's kind of like the radio kind of thing and there was de decent groups and for the podcast and yeah. worlds i was learning a lot but when they opened it up it just got so toxic and it, like you oh, go into a room and then it's like they're not even talking about what's it's supposed to be and they're just having a conversation between the administrators and i, I was like it happened so much i just i mean I still have it on my phone but it's like no nah. yeah I, I uh, for my social audio, I use an app called Wisdom, and I've, I've I give talks on Wisdom uh, every now and then, and that's you know if you happen to be in the app when that's happening, then you get to hear it live. But they stay recorded. You can go visit my profile on Wisdom, and hear past talks that I've given. Um, it's social audio, but it's one-on-one -on -one social audio. You can only have two people talking at a time, the main speaker and whoever they bring into the, their guest seat. And so it's, yeah, it's interesting because I've given a couple of talks that are just talks, but most of the talks become like mini podcast moments. Like they become these conversations and an exchange of ideas that I think was the intent behind Clubhouse, but because you can only bring one person into that hot seat at a time, there's a significantly less posturing for attention. And um, I've, yeah, I've even made a few friends on that app, which super surprised me. But be, when you have these conversations about life and philosophy and um, and great communication and meditation and whatever other people are talking about, it's like, it's a very cool experience so that's been better than clubhouse uh, but i still enjoy marco polo in terms of talking to people i'm connected to i must check that out listen i've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation so you might let people know how can they get in contact with you yeah it's been fun talking with you as well i feel like we could talk for ages um but if people are interested if you the listener are interested in learning more about what i do visit artofchange.com you'll see uh there's information about the podcast there as well um but you can always visit the changedpodcast.com if you want to just go directly to the podcast's website um and yeah those are the things come Come check it out. I, I don't even think I have a link to wisdom there. So you just have to get on the wisdom app and look for me if you want to try listening to those talks or even having a conversation with me, which you're welcome to come do. Perfect, perfect. And I just encourage people to check out your podcast because it's like very similar to this kind of conversation that, you know, a nice relaxed style, but a very enjoyable conversation. So I would, uh, I put the link in up from all of them on both the audio and the video. But thank you very much. Thanks. Totally enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. This is a wonderful way to start my day and I hope a lovely uh, evening activity for you. So that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. As mentioned, we're on YouTube. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five-star rating, subscribe.
and make sure you give uh, Aiden a subscription as well and a thumbs up because and a review because it all helps. Until next week, take care.